Hi. Ready? Okay. Um, welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, you know who I am. I'm David. And uh, sorry. Oh, thought someone said something. Okay. Uh, I'll just give you a little background uh, about me and the idea of what we'll talk about tonight. I've I never went to school. I finished high school, 16 years old. Uh, I've been on my own pretty much taking care of myself since I'm 13, but fully since I'm 16. And yet, without an education, without any family, starting from literally zero, days without food when I was younger, I have owned over 20 different kinds of companies, from retail up to the nuclear industry. I've had the top nuclear physicists in the world coming into my office. So I've had quite a wide range of businesses. I was a Zen monk. I've studied many mysticisms. Uh, I was a millionaire at 25. I retired at 28. I've had a wide range of business experiences, spiritual experiences, and life experiences. I've endured the death of my partner, went through a long illness. So, and I've had ups and downs, many ups and downs, making a fortune, losing a fortune, making and losing. And yet, through everything, I always recover. And this is something people always admired and want in themselves, is the ability to deal with all the ups and downs of life and still continue, not get destroyed, not get shattered or ruined. So I've been teaching for quite a long time now, um, about 30 years or so, and the ideas are about making money, about personal development, about success, but it's all based on my experiences and not really things I've studied. All right, so just so you know, this is my own life experience and the thousands or so of students that I've had, their experiences as well. Little do my students know they were guinea pigs, like lab rats, testing out the theories, testing out everything to see how people understand and can deal with um, the philosophies that I've learned through, throughout my life, okay? So that's basically it, a little bit about me. Um, what we're going to do, we'll talk for about an hour, I'll talk for about an hour, uh, then we'll have some questions, take a little break, and then I'll start over, we'll talk a little bit more, more questions, and then we'll end it there, okay? So, my work is basically covering the three main aspects of life, all right? There's only really three things that a human being ever cares about or really matters, which is your money, because we all need money to live. So that means your business, your job, anything to do with money and material things. All right? Relationship, of course, that's very important. Our relationship with our partner, with other people we work with, our friends, and so on. And the self-esteem. That's the most important part. And the reason I put self-esteem in the bottom, in the middle, is because your self-esteem will determine the quality of your experiences in your work life and your financial success as well as in your relationships. And relationships, by the way, is not only with, with your partner, with your family, with your kids, your friends, but with yourself. And that's where the self-esteem is. So that really holds up the other two aspects. So my work is basically working on that part of us which affects all of the three main parts of our external life. Okay? So, what we'll do tonight is we'll talk about foundation principles. That's the first hour or so. Then we'll talk about the cause and solution of the obstacles in your life, how you'll be able to overcome everything. By the way, you can all hear me well? Everyone in the back? Yes? I like that. I saw a comedian once. He was giving a talk and, you know, in a big auditorium, and someone in the back yells out, I can't hear you! And he said, so tell me something. If, how come... If I can hear you from over here, how come you can't hear me from over there? So, if you can hear me well, then that's, that's good. All right, so the idea is a building is made up of bricks. All right? Your life is made up of individual events. And every event has built your building. Now, that could be a castle, a palace, or it could be an old shack, it could be falling down. But your life is basically the building that is built on the events in your life. 
Now, those events have affected you, and they are affecting the future of your life, right? Every day, because of the past events. So, that's basically it. We're going to talk about the foundation principles, which are blocks, which will build a better castle for, for how you live through your life. Okay? Here's our first principle. Why things do not change. In your life, you might have the same repetitive events, things are not changing, you're not getting the success you want, whatever it may be. And this, I've always realized this, but maybe you trust Mark Twain better than me. It is not what you don't know that gets you into trouble, but it is what you know for certain that is just not true, that is wrong. I figured out how to always be right. You can be 100% always right every time for the rest of your life. It's really actually simple. All you do, if you're not 1,000% certain it's correct, don't say anything. And then by virtue of never being wrong, you're always right. Okay? So, the reason that it's what you know for certain that is just not true, that's the problem because what happens is when you know something, your mind shuts down. You stop listening, you stop learning, even if you think you are open-minded and listening. Now the problem is, this is the greatest obstacle I have had in trying to help people, is that if you think you know what I'm talking about, you stop listening, your mind shuts down. But the problem is you might have heard it similar, 80% similar, but I'm giving you a little extra, something a little different that you're not going to listen to because you thought you already heard it. So subconsciously your mind shuts down. It's basically you have to dispose of a bomb, deactivate a bomb, and you read the manual and it says cut the red wire after you cut the blue wire. So if you don't listen to everything with an open mind, you miss the value. Now, my success is based on knowing I'm stupid. I know I'm stupid. I know I know nothing. So that's why I can listen and learn. And when, I, like I said, 11th grade, 16 years old, but when the nuclear physicists came into my office and we were talking, they asked me where I got my PhD. <laughs> my business partner, who was the scientist, laughs. But the reason is because when everybody talks, I listen with a really open mind and I absorb things. You, does anyone you think you have a bad memory? Or you know people who have a bad memory? And you say, oh, I have a bad memory. You know what? You don't have a bad memory. What you have is lack of interest. When you're really interested in something, or your mind is open, a lot can get in. And then you'll retain it. But if you're not interested, or you think you already know, and you have subconsciously shut down, you won't remember it, because it didn't actually get in. Okay? So... I'm sure you've all either done this or had this done to you, where you send a little email, two, three lines, and the answer comes back, and you're like, what's wrong with this person? Didn't they read? Can't they read a simple email? All right? This happens? You ever meet with that? And you're wondering, like, what's wrong? It's such a simple instruction. How could they not get it right? It's like two students of mine. One, he owned the house, and the other student, she was renting a room from him. One day... The boy who owned the house, he did something nice for the girl, so the girl bought him a present. She bought a chocolate bar, left it on his desk with a note. And the note simply said, here's something sweet to say thank you for the sweet thing you did for me. And I left a Coca-Cola for you in the fridge, so it'll be cold. Great. And she had to go out, and then when he came home, he sent her a text. He said, thank you for the chocolate bar. And by the way, I see you have a Coca-Cola in the fridge. Do you mind if I have it? And she had to tell me, what's wrong with this boy? And so I asked him, I said, what's wrong with you? You can't read two lines? He said, well, I saw the chocolate and I read, thank you. So I thought I knew what the note said. Didn't bother reading the rest of it. All right. So this is a major problem in life and why many people come to my talks and learn nothing and say, oh, I heard it all before. Boring. Because they say, oh yeah, I heard that, I heard that, I heard that. But you didn't hear what I have to say. You only heard the part that's already out there. Do you know how to tell a really good lie? Make sure there's always a bit of truth in it. 
Because people will hear the truth, then they'll believe everything you say. So this, as I said, is the first principle that you really need to understand is that if you think you know what I'm talking about, that is the end of your learning. That is where the limit of your life experience will be because you stop listening and it's subconscious. You don't realize it. So I'm trying to drum that in so that you will make sure your mind always stays open. All right. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an IQ test to prove the principle. Okay. So what is this? It's pretty obvious. A piece of green plastic, right? There's nothing hard about that. You're all reasonably intelligent, except that you all failed the IQ test because actually it's two pieces of plastic, yellow and blue. All right. So just try to remember that when you see something or you hear something, it doesn't mean that's what it really is. You've got to look deeper, think deeper. Einstein said, curiosity has its own reason for existence. And the reason is, curiosity means you keep an open mind, you keep learning, you keep evolving. So this is the first lesson. Your mind is closed, but you don't know that because you think it's open. So you have to remember that you always have to watch to make sure your mind is open and you're always paying attention. Now, the reason that a human being will do this is this is how you're assembled. Okay. You've got an arm down there and a leg up here. Now you can still wobble through life. You know, you might limp a little bit, but you can walk around, you can get things done. And so you think you're fine, except when you put your foot in your mouth and say something stupid, which I do so often, I can still get my feet behind my head. I'm so flexible. <laughs> so because you're functioning, you think you're fine. But I'm here to tell you, you're not fine. And you could be so much more with the principles I'll give you tonight. And if you want to continue with my work further on. So because you're functioning, you don't realize you're limited. You don't reach your potential. So that's another principle to always remember. Okay. I'm going to give you a few exercises tonight. You're welcome to take pictures of the slides. Or you can email me and I'll email you the whole slideshow and I'm videoing the talk and also an audio recording. So you can also have a copy of the recording after all you've got to do is ask. All right. No charge. Just have to ask. All right. So your first exercise is keep proving you do not know until the only thing you know is you don't know anything. Whenever I meet someone, I'm talking, I'm in a new situation. They start talking about something and say, do, do you know this? And I always say, no, I don't know. I don't mind if you think I'm stupid, but maybe I know 80%, 90%. And there may be some little thing you tell me that's different. That's how I keep learning. That's how you keep growing and evolving. Okay. And don't say you're too old to change. We can always change. All right. So that's your first exercise. Every minute from now on, you never assume you know anything. And when you think, you know, look for proof that you were wrong and that you didn't know. And the more you prove it to yourself, the more your mind will open because, okay. I came to Singapore because I think they're very intelligent people on average. You have a majority, a bigger number of intelligent people percentage wise than in other countries because of the nature of Singapore and type of work and businesses are here. Um, so you think you're intelligent and I'm telling you to prove that you're not prove to yourself that you're not so smart. So you've got to always look for events where you prove that you were wrong. Look for proof. You're wrong. Now people say, oh, that's so negative. I'm very negative. In, in the sense that all my work is a little bit like the Buddhist philosophy, which is the light is bright. You're already enlightened. It's just covered with blankets. So instead of trying to turn up the power on the light, we remove the blankets. So when I say I have a negative philosophy, it means that instead of trying to acquire more tools, more skills, more things, so let's remove the obstacles 
that are preventing us from being naturally intelligent and reaching our potential. All right? So it is not depressing. It is encouraging because you're lightening, enlightening yourself. All right? So look for as many events as you can find to prove you were wrong got to let that sink in. And you'd be amazed how that really increases your intelligence. This next principle, the wheel of life. Life is a wheel. You, you are a wheel. Okay, your body, let's say, you're like a bicycle wheel with all the spokes connected to the hub. So as the wheel turns, that means I get up in the morning, I do my exercise, I go to gym, I get in the bus or the car, I go to work, then I'm at work, I'm a doctor, a lawyer, a janitor, a cleaner, whatever it is, then I go play sports, all these different things. As you're going through your day, each spoke is a skill. So you're skillful at your profession, you're skillful at your sport, whatever it may be. You're interacting with your partner, with your children, so on. So as you're rolling through life, as at each moment, a different spoke is there. Now, all of these skills that you have are connected to a central hub. The hub is your mind. And so the only thing that matters is your mind. All right? Your mind is determining all your experiences in your life. I've been, well, I've been in well over 30 different kinds of businesses, all right? as I said, quite a variety. And that is because skill is only 10% of your success. We're talking about business now. Skill is 10% of your success. 90% is your personality, the quality of your mind, your character. Because that determines how people will interact with you. All right? In my companies, in Montreal, when I started, had my businesses there, nobody ever quit. I never had someone quit. They loved working for me because I was good to work with. People always asked me to work for them. I haven't had a job since I'm 19. That's when I, I never worked for anyone else. But I started when I was 12, my first job. And from 12 to 19, I had a lot of jobs. I never applied for a job in my life because any job I had, People I worked with, customers, would give me a job. Say, come work for me, I'll give you more. Come work for me, I'll give you more. Even though I didn't know anything about the business. Because they want the personality and character that I had, which is what hopefully you'll get in time. You get the principles. All right? So that is the only thing. So when you're thinking about how can I make more money, how can I improve my business career? How can I get a better relationship? How can I find a relationship? Whatever it may be. And you look for all ways to, to approach each of those spokes. You might find that you're never achieving success. That's because it's not the thing itself you need to work on. It's your mind. All right? Now, the thing about a mind, your mind, is you can lose everything in your life. You can lose your money. You can lose your relationship, you can lose your health, you can lose a limb, you can lose anything. But you can never lose your mind. That is the only thing you cannot lose. And if you lose your mind, you're not you anyway. So that's why the mind, your mind, which is your personality, your character, is so important. Because it's the only thing that is the constant in your life. So that's why our work is about getting that mind to be a certain way. Now, your mind, we're not talking about your brain, right? This is your mind when you're born. It's a sponge. Look, look at a little baby. Little baby doesn't know anything, it, but it's learning. I love it. When you look at little, little kids, look at their face when they go to new places. <gasps> oh, amazing. Look at their eyes. You were there once. You may not remember. But you were, you got, came out and you went, wow, what is this place? Weird world. And from then on, you're looking around for years and years at all these bizarre things and bizarre people. And you're learning. Now you're also learning emotional reactions. So you're getting events that create emotions. That's stored in your mind, forming your personality. Your emotions then affect your life. If you're very hypersensitive, you're very temperamental, you're very easily disturbed, or you're very stable, very strong, very open-minded, all right? 
So there's only one tool. Everybody says, I want tools, more tools. There's only one tool you need to work on, and that's your mind. Okay? Use it by thinking and observing your thoughts. Always. Always reflect on what you're thinking, why you're thinking. So you keep an open mind at all times. All right? Now, a next principle. Your life is a gray area. You may think you're very clear about certain things or on my career or whatever it is, but everything about you as a human being is a gray area, meaning maybe is, maybe isn't. Not so sure. And the reason is human beings have an infinite capacity for self-deception. I call it self-lie. I don't know about here in Singapore, but in America or Western countries, when you're arguing with someone or discussing, you have a difference, they say, I have my truth, you have your truth. They love to say, do you say that here? My truth, your truth? What a ridiculous thing to say. I have my lie, you have your lie. My illusion, your illusion. How can we have two different truths? Anybody look up the definition of truth in the dictionary? The floor is solid. Water is not, unless it's frozen. That's a truth. It's universal. But if you want to think you have your truth, you have your self-lie. Now, I'll tell you, I think, the most bizarre, mind-boggling lie that was told that my mother believed, and a lot of other women at her time. Believe it or not, they believed breast milk is bad for the baby. Not that formula may be better, but breast milk is actually bad for the baby. You must give them formula. So I told her, are you nuts? How could you believe this? Well, the doctor said so. They know. I said, so did you think, mm, what are we here, 10,000 years of humanity on earth or whatever it is? How do we survive this far? You know, because it's always been breast milk. How could it be bad? But they believed it. And I have other friends at that age, and she said, yeah, we all believed it. Because the doctor said so. This particular principle, I want to, you know, this brick, is that you have to realize you lie to yourself about almost everything you believe because you trust doctors, uh, whatever, people in charge, parents, priests, imam, whatever your religion is. You trust people in authority. That's what humans do. Because it's much easier for someone to give you a cheat sheet with the answers than to have to figure it out yourself. So this is, again, you could say negative because I'm telling you that you have to doubt everything you believe about yourself. Um, and we'll give you a little exercise on how to do that later. But it is a principle. You have to doubt everything you believe because even though you think it is truth, it is very likely a lie that you were fed by someone who believed it themselves. That's why you believed it. But maybe it's generations of lies. Okay? So remember that going forward, do not trust. My grandfather always said, never believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. Doubt everything. Now you could say, oh my God, that's so negative. I have to doubt. I can't trust anything. But again, it goes back to Mr. Einstein. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. So if I doubt and I look and think for myself, I have a better chance of finding truth and expanding the capacity of my mind. So it's not actually a negative thing to doubt everything and everybody. It gets you to think. It's quite useful. All right? So here's another principle. If you are a slave, the greatest joy is freedom, right? What does every slave want? To be free. If you live in the illusion that you are already free, you're not going to try and achieve freedom because, going back, if I think I know, I stop listening or learning, and I am a bundle of self-lies. So, you live in the self-lie illusion that you're free, so you never look for achieving freedom. And suffering is caused 
by the self lie that you're already free when in fact you're a prisoner. Now, what is suffering? Suffering means stress, anxiety, discomfort with life, can't sleep well, ill health, and so on. This is the kind of suffering I mean, where you can't really open up and love fully because you always have some doubts, fears, right? So, we need to focus on thinking and proving that you're actually a prisoner of your own mind and beliefs. So you think you're free, but you're not. You have to keep considering that. I think I'm free, but I'm not. What I believe is a lie. I'm believing an illusion about myself. Right? All of these things are going to build up this nice building, which is very strong, but it takes all of these individual points. All right? Now, insanity. You know the definition of insanity? I love it. Insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Right? So many people's lives is just like this train, going in circles, round and round and round, their whole life getting nowhere, thinking you're getting somewhere because you're moving, you're going in circles. All right? So if you think you're fine, right, with the arm and the leg, you're hobbling through life, everything is good, you think you're free, but you're not, your life is just going to go in circles. You're not going to get anywhere. So to prove a principle, we look for the evidence. So you have to see, is your life continually progressing? Or are you facing the same repetitive problems? stuck in the same job, not advancing in your career, always meeting the same type of people, always having same disappointments in relationships, things like that. Okay? To prove that you are stuck in a circle. Now, here's your self-lie. You think you're a free bird. Many people say, I'm free. I can do anything. I can go anywhere. I can do anything I want. Then why don't you? Well, I don't want to. Uh -huh. But why? Right? So there's your illusion. If you think you're a free person, everybody think they're free? Who thinks they're actually this train stuck in a circle? Right? So you think you're free, but the truth is you're living your life like a train, just going down a straight track. And you're looking at the forest on both sides and the birds over there saying, yeah, yeah, I'm a bird. I could fly. I'm just happy on the train track right now. It's stable. It's secure. I know where it's going. I like that. But I'm free. I can go anytime. All right? And so what happens is you've got a, an inner conflict. You want to be free. You know you're not. But you try to convince yourself you are. And there's a lot of energy wasted. I sleep three hour, four hour. And I'm full of energy, you might notice. I'm always like this, full of energy. But I don't need to sleep. I eat usually just one meal a day. I don't need a lot of food. I don't need a lot of sleep. And I go until, yeah, usually I'm up until 2 or 3 in the morning, wake up at sometimes 6. Because I don't waste energy on these kind of conflicts. When you believe and are trying to convince yourself that you're a bird, when in fact you're stuck on the train track, it burns up a lot of energy. So I've had students, they need to sleep 10 hours a day. If I don't get 10 hours sleep, I'm useless. And over time, they come down to five hours and have even more energy because they start to get the principles and they, they, they stop the inner conflict. All right? So that's another principle. Your energy is drained by inner conflict caused by wanting to believe you're a bird when you're actually stuck on the train track. So basically, there you are. You're a bird. You think you can fly, but you're really just a train and you're stuck in that way. So, ending the conflict releases energy. So that's why I'm saying it's a negative. We remove conflicts to get more energy. Because if you are trying to fill a sieve, you know what a sieve is, right? A bowl filled with holes? You can put a lot of water, you can pour the ocean in there, nothing is ever gonna stay. So, that's generally what people's lives are, especially in big cities. City life, corporate life, your life is like a sieve and you try to do things to get more energy, but you're not stopping the things that are draining your energy. All right? And the time it stops is 
when the train wrecks. Heart attack, stroke, death of a family member, loss of your money, bankruptcy, Ill, whatever. Or it could be you're sharing an office with someone who's 38 years old and he just drops dead of a heart attack in front of you. You say, oh my God. A lot of train wrecks. And you get the train wreck and you go, I got to stop and think about it. Now, usually what happens is you stop for a while until the cranes come, they put the train back on the track and you keep going on the track. But sometimes it'll give you a chance. Now, you might not always reach a train wreck in your life, but don't wait for a train wreck. <laughs> I'm saying you can actually change before the train wrecks and you can become the bird who flies away from the train. I had one company. It was a software company. I'm the businessman, my business partner was the programmer. He wrote the code, he made the software, I came in to try and market it. So I looked at it and I said, we'll never sell this because the user interface is horrible. You need to be a programmer to figure out how to use this. It's retail, I want to sell it retail. It has to be simple. Here's a redesign. I redesigned it, I said, make it like this. He said, no, I refuse. Why? It's what we need to sell. He says, I refuse because I spent six months designing this user interface. And if I change it, it means I wasted six months of my life. Okay. Another six or eight months go by, I still can't sell one license. He finally agrees to change it. So what happened? Instead of six months wasted, he wasted over a year. So your life can change at any time if you're willing to change it. But if you keep saying, yeah, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, it's just wasting more time, all right? So the question is, are you wasting your entire life? Stop deceiving yourself that you have an open mind, that you're free, and start doing the exercises I'll give you, and we'll see if you can actually change that. Now, here's the next principle. You are not really you. This one's a tough one. You've spent your entire life being you. Are you what? Are you, um, you know, Indians? Uh, well, okay, you can't be black, but, <laughs> you know, the style of clothing, the religion, the culture. Are you really you? What are you really? Now, you I'm talking to, not you. In other words, not you, you. That's confusing, right? Well, let's separate you from you. There's you, the person you are. Everything about you. And that's who you think you are. Then there's you, that consciousness inside you. The thing that has feelings, intuitions, a desire to change, a desire for more, that looks up and says, there's got to be more than this. Then you quickly put it aside. Instead of that part of you, I don't know if you want to believe you have a soul, if there's something that reincarnates, that continues, just something that thinks. That's really you. But you now are the person you are. Just to give you an idea, si tu parles pas de français, no, I'm sorry, that's another story. <laughs> Just to give you an idea, if you're an American, born in little Middle West America, white Christian family, born in the same hospital, the same parents, everything identical, except that one day old, they took the little baby you and sent you off to India. And you were raised by parents in Gujarat, in India, south of Bombay. You would be talking like an Indian. Your head would wobble, your hands would go like this when you talk. You'd be a vegetarian, you'd be a Hindu. You wouldn't even speak to be talking English. No English talking, you speak Hindustani. You would be Indian. Total. Sorry, my mother is from India. I can do this well. Okay. <laughs> this is not racist. I'm, my mother is Indian, so I can do. Okay. You would be totally Indian. Huh? Same white body, but to totally different. You see? What are you? Are you whoever you are? No. You're formed into who you are. But you're not real. You, whatever that soul is, that thing, that may be real. But you, who came here tonight, mainly isn't real. The definition of reality, I take it from Buddhism. I like Buddhism. Nice philosophy. Buddha said, everything is an illusion. 
So then you run around thinking, oh, come on, this table is real, the floor is real, the food is real. Yeah, 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 yeah that's real. The illusion means it is permanent. When Buddha said everything is an illusion, he didn't say it's not real. He said that it, the illusion is you think it's going to last. You think it's permanent. All right? And so you are not real because you were formed. Or you could talk like this, you know. It is very possible anything could have happened. So by virtue of you being formed by your parents, your culture, your religion, all of these things that you were brought up in, all your attitudes, how you deal with your family, what your obligations are, all of that was given to you without your consent. And you now as an adult have the opportunity to totally change everything about yourself. What we want to change with, with what my life is devoted to helping you is to change all your bad habits, all the negative qualities, all the limitations. I would like to see the human species, the experiment, in my view, the experiment that the human species is, is basically a caterpillar butterfly thing. They took an animal called a human, they took some kind of a consciousness, and they stuck it in there. And they said, let's see what we can evolve. Can we make a whole new species? Now we can see the idea, the concept, in people, different intellects, and, and different skill capacities, and different talents, and so on. So I believe that every human being has the capacity to evolve to something higher than just an animal. And in order to do that, we have to remove all our negative qualities. So that's what we want to reform, okay, with our work. So that's the other principle. You're not real. You have no limitations other than that which you have accepted, which have been put onto you. And everything can be changed, like the glass, smash it, melt it, and make it into something else. The only problem and the reason that people don't like to do this is can you imagine being smashed and melted? That's painful. So there's a resistance. But the difference is, would you rather be a train on a track going in circles until you crash? Or would you like to be a bird that can fly anywhere? So now it's a question of how much you are happy with your life as it is, or you want to reach an unlimited potential. I go, I walk around outside, so let's say I go in orchard. I, I did that last week, I was in orchard, and I look at everybody, you know, going there. They're all in their suits and ties and their business clothes, and they're walking, walking, you know, all so serious. And I'm thinking, oh, I'm free. Look at that. I said, this feeling is what I want to give people. Complete contentment, freedom, which doesn't mean you don't have to keep your job and fulfill your obligations. It's a mental attitude. And with this attitude, you can get into 30 different kinds of businesses. You can do anything. So that's the principles of, of, of what I'm trying to give you. Now, next important point. What is the most important thing for a human being? From birth till death. And I've traveled now to 81 countries, all right? And I have studied a dozen or so different religions and traditions. I've spent most of my life doing this. In all these countries, at any age, there's one consistency to every single human being, the need of companionship. And everything you do is to serve the, the let's say, instinct, the nature that needs companionship. Unfortunately, you'll do a lot of things which are self-destructive because you've been misguided to believe that's going to give you the companionship you need. All right? So, here is something you have to accept, and you have to prove it to yourself until you really accept it. Everything you do is to serve the need of companionship. I want to be rich. Why? People will like me because I can buy them presents. I want to be famous. Ah, oh, then I have a lot of fans, admirers. I want to be beautiful and have a nice hair. And, you know, you put on your makeup and your nice clothes and all of these things, so I'll be attractive. Guy wants big muscles. Women will like me. I can protect her. Everything we do is to have companionship. Then we go and have children so that we'll have companions when we're old and our friends are all old and dead or we can't leave the house. Everything. 
It's for the need of companionship. So when you're in your business career and so on and you're just not getting further or you get ideas, you start, you lose motivation, you can't finish things and you say, but I had a great idea. I really was excited with that and then fizzled out because you believe the idea was what you wanted. But it's not. In some way, whatever your idea was, you thought would serve your need of companionship. And so when you get it clear what's driving you, and you accept that truth, that it's not to be famous for the sake of being famous, but it is to be famous so there will be many people who want you around them, and that everything you do is for this need of companionship, your goal now is clear and it is real. Now you will have the power to succeed at anything. Your ideas will become much more clear, your motivation will continue, your success will be far greater. If you're uh, you know, working in a company, let's say you're a salesman, when you say, oh, I got to reach my sales target. I gave a talk to a five-star hotel condominium thing, a huge tower. It was actually a Trump Tower in Panama. They changed the name now. <laughs> they got rid of the name. They said, we don't want to be associated with them anymore. Um, and I gave a talk to their sales and marketing staff. And I said, the best way to sell, when I was a salesman, never had a target. I don't care if I sell or not. I have no interest in making the sale for the sake of I made that sale. I made that number. All I cared about was getting to know somebody, really getting to know someone, making a connection, sincerely making a new friend without any motivation whatsoever. And then people always trusted me. They feel close because you're not trying to get something from them. So if you're a salesman, realize why am I doing this? So my kids will go to college. I need the money. I'm a social person whatever it is. But when you find that everything is driven by this need of companionship long term, it changes your whole attitude. It makes you far more sincere in everything you do. All right. So when you think your career is important, you miss out something. Then you become, uh, women become more like men in a negative sense. People become more closed, more greedy, more narrow-minded, less social, more occupied with their career. My career is so important. My career is stable. A relationship is not stable. You can't trust a man. A man will go. Of course, I don't date men, so I have to say what women tell me. Uh, now that I'm single, I can date, so I'm getting a lot of experience here. It's amazing, the attitude. You can't trust a man. They come and go. But my career I can trust. And I said, are you crazy? What do you mean you can trust a career? Companies go bankrupt. Economy goes down. You'll get fired in a minute if they don't like you. You can't trust a career. So that's why if we know that what we really need is this need of companionship, we develop a personality that gets friends that will stay with us no matter what. All right? So switching to saying, I. I need a companion, so I need a partner, but relationships are unreliable. I'll devote myself to my career. This is not going to satisfy you inside. And again, you're going to have the conflict, subconscious and conscious. The truth inside you, companionship, the conscious trying to say a self lie that business will do it, career will do it. Inner conflict drains energy, your health suffers, and you need to sleep more. All right? So, that's another principle. Um, so just looking, I have a couple of notes, make sure I stay on track because I tend to get off track. I know too much. Everything I say is my own experience, but I know too many things. So found a way to keep notes. What matters most? All right. Is it your career? Is it companionship? Is it your relationship? Is it your health? What matters most? So let me tell you about two old guys, Harry and Peter. Peter says, you know, Harry, they're in their 80s, mid 80s, old guys. You know, I'm thinking, I should get a new wife. Peter says, good for you. Brilliant idea. You're right. Why? Your last years you should spend alone. Good for you. Tell me, what are you looking for in a woman? And he says, well, what I want is, you know, like that. 
and she should be pretty good, you know. And her own, you know. Yeah. And now I went like this. And his friend Peter says, you know, I got to ask you. I understand you want a nice body. I understand a woman with a brain good to talk to. And she should have her own money. Why should you pay for everything? But what I don't understand, why it matters so much to you. Why you want a woman with arthritis? <laughs> so, what matters most? Try to break it up with a little joke, you know. Here's one. What matters most? Okay, next principle. What is the most powerful force in nature? The most powerful force. What do you think? kind of cheating, gave you a picture, um, a cloud. The most powerful force in nature is a cloud. So we need to emulate the cloud. We want to be the most power, right? Why is a cloud the most powerful force? Because a cloud, totally versatile, changes shape, comes and goes. You can't catch it. You can't destroy it. You can't make it. You can't do anything to it. You can't hurt it. A plane flies right through it. Nobody gets hurt. Completely powerful. It can be a white puffy thing, decorate a blue sky, or a cloud can go so black it blots out the sun. It can turn day to night. It can give lightning. It can make floods. You know, mountains, when you see a lake, that's not the bottom of the mountain. The mountain keeps going down. So the rain from a cloud can flood the mountain. It can erode the mountain. But the mountain can't do anything to a cloud. So the cloud is so powerful, and it can be any combination of that. It can you know, blot out the sun and be a decoration at the same time. So cloud, totally powerful, untouchable, unhurtable. But a mountain, excuse me, which is typically what a human being is, because I am important. I am a doctor. I am a lawyer. I am a CEO. I am a whatever. A mountain doesn't move. And when the plane flies into a mountain, everyone dies, the mountain gets chipped. So here is something else, another principle, is that you're always, a human being normally is trying to be a mountain, standing tall, I'm Everest, get attention. But in fact, that makes you a target. That makes you very limited. Whereas if you're a cloud, you're totally versatile and free. Nothing can harm you if you're a cloud. Now, where do we get harmed? We get harmed by words. Somebody said something. Hopefully, you have never experienced, nor you ever will experience, being physically attacked. That's rather rare, but the words are at you every day. Now, words are like a plane. They fly into the mountain, painful, or you can be a cloud and let them go right through you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about words and communication. But the principle is a cloud never gets insulted, never gets hurt, never gets disturbed. So that's the analogy we want is to achieve being more like a cloud than a mountain. So you can just look at clouds every now and then when you see them and start pondering. Look how it's moving. Look how it's changing. No one can hurt it. But it can do anything because I look out my window here and it's a beautiful day, nice puffy white clouds, and an hour later it's black and pouring rain. Wow, that's power. All right? So the only thing is when I say that a cloud never gets hurt by anything anyone says, you can insult me, you can say anything you want, wouldn't affect me, does not give the cloud the right to be rude to other people. All right, so that's the only caveat I have to say, is that being a cloud doesn't mean you can send lightning bolts down as often as you want to everybody you would like to fry. All right, so we need to have that little uh, caveat. Another principle, which is very common these days, is the idea of boundaries. You cannot say that to me. You are not allowed to talk to me that way. You have to behave a certain way in front of me. You're not allowed to reference my race, religion, culture. You're not allowed. You are not allowed to say that to me. 
There's the boundaries, right? Very common thing. Now what those boundaries do is they put you in a bubble because you're isolating yourself, playing God, telling other people what they cannot do. And yet you think you're free, but you're not. When you live with these ideas of boundaries, limitations, you're putting yourself in a bubble, you're not free. And the train wreck is when something flies in and pops the bubble and you come crashing down to earth and you freak out because somebody said the wrong word. So I am very anti the modern views, boundaries, political correctness, all of these things. You know the definition of political correctness? It's calling shit by a different name and expecting it will not stink. Right? It's incredible. Every word is changing. I was away for about seven years. I isolated myself for about seven years. I came back and it's like a whole new vocabulary. What happened? Nobody has a boyfriend and girlfriend or a husband and wife. Now they got partners. <laughs> Everybody's in partnership. Where'd love go? It's everything is a business transaction. It's amazing. All these words are changing and you think it changes anything? No. Well, yes. Isolates you. So, if we have boundaries, then you're a mountain or you're a country at war with somebody else, right? If you have political correctness, that's creating boundaries. So, all of these things where you have set yourself up to believe that words and all these things people will tell you are impactful, are painful, are harmful, is separating you, is isolating you. But if you're a cloud, you can say anything you want to me. I can't get insulted. I've been out with friends and they said, oh, aren't you going to say something? I said, what? That guy just insulted you. He said, I did? did? I had no idea I was even insulted. So it's not that I can take it and then, okay, I'm going to cool. No. I don't cool down or deal with it. I don't even know if I'm being insulted. It just went right through. So this is another principle. I'm telling you to totally go against society and have no boundaries and have no more political correctness, but you have to respect other people, right? But you must not have that set up in your mind. And now you see what happens is when you have these boundaries and this, I was talking to one woman, she was saying, you know what? Nobody even asks me out. It's been three years. I'm single. No one even asks me out. And I said, well, you know, it could be because you've got this, like, don't talk to me about this. Don't say that to me. You're scary. You know? When you have all your boundaries and this stuff, you, you become innately scary to talk to. I mean, you know, you go in a company now. I guess it must be similar here, but I don't think it's as bad. But like in America, I, I invest in the stock market, so I hear all the news of companies. This guy is sued. That guy is sued. One guy, they were saying he, he's running for what, a judge or something. When he was 15 years in high school, he tried to have sex with a girl. This is a 15 year old boy. What do you expect? But you can't say anything. It's too dangerous. You lose your job. You get sued. This is what political correctness and boundaries have done. They've separated all of us into bubbles. So we cannot actually connect with an open heart, with love to each other, to our friends, to welcome them, to be someone safe to talk to. So there's fear permeating our world by all these boundaries. You become overly sensitive, people scared to talk to you, things like that. Now, so you making yourself unapproachable. Now we're talking about relationships, all right? In business, yes, co-workers and that, but you've got your corporate world, that's one thing. But in personal relationships, finding a partner, boyfriend, girlfriend, how approachable are you? Do you make yourself such that people say, oh, I'm so comfortable with you. I can say anything to you. I'm not scared of getting you pissed off. I'll tell you one real story. My brother, poor fellow, he got married. Um, he was, you know, 28, she was 21, they were religious, so they were both virgins in their 20s. They got married, the party went on till like 3 a.m. So you can imagine what happened after 3 a.m. 
Anyhow, the next day after the wedding, he's talking, they're talking, and she starts crying. He said, it took me two hours, two hours to calm her down enough to find out why she was crying. And finally, she said, when I was talking, you yawned. You're bored with me. You don't love me. And he said, from that moment on, I couldn't yawn. Never mind, say anything. <laughs> and that was his married life, which didn't last too, too long. But imagine that. The fear he had to live with. Because if yawning could get her to cry for two hours, what about the wrong word? Oh my God. So, in your life, if you say, I'm not getting any dates. Oh, I get dates, but it never works out. Oh, I keep losing my job. Oh, people in the office don't like me. Oh, I have conflicts with people. I don't get it. They're, they're all crazy. Like my father, he says, everybody is wrong. I'm perfect. Everyone else is wrong. All right? This is why your boundaries political correctness. You make yourself too sensitive. So imagine, and I can tell you from my own experience, if you have no boundaries, people love you. They love to talk to you. They feel so good, so comfortable with you. That's how you'll get the companionship that you innately need by removing all of these ridiculous principles that are being pushed so hard as this is the right thing. And why do people believe something which I think I've established is obviously ridiculous and self-destructive. But why do we believe it? Because it came from a psychologist or a psychiatrist who did studies and, oh, they've got PhDs and they said this. They're professionals, they know, so they must be right. You see? Human being is gullible. We'll believe anything if it comes from an authoritative figure. Are you getting the picture? The bricks are piling up. We're almost getting a house now, right? comes from an authoritative figure, therefore it must be true. They say it with confidence. I don't want to have to think, so I will believe what I'm told. I will deceive myself to believe this is true. I will think I am free, but actually I'm living on the train. And I've isolated myself under the lie that I'm opening up. Okay? So, we need to break out of those bubbles. All right. Next principle. Fights, arguments, conflicts. Ah, 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 ah. Have you noticed? I'm sure you have. When you're arguing with someone, say, you don't understand what I'm saying. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, I do. I understand you perfectly. No, you don't. I know what I'm talking about and I can tell you don't understand. Yes, I understand you perfectly. Right? That's the problem. You always think you understand, but the other one knows you don't. Anybody relate to this? <laughs> okay, you don't understand. Now, I figured out something. If you truly understand somebody, you cannot argue with them. You might disagree, but you would understand their point of view and therefore cannot argue. So, the more we realize that we don't know anything, the more open our mind is, and the more we will be able to understand other people, therefore less arguments. You know the difference between a monologue and a dialogue, right? Easy, right? Another IQ test, right? Um, monologue, basically one person talking to himself, like I'm doing, and a dialogue, when it's an argument, is two people talking to themselves. <laughs> Notice that one? Uh -uh. Watch your arguments. Watch other people arguing. So, I grew up with that. Watch my mother and my father. I said, but, but what you're talking about is not what he's talking about. And you both think you're talking about the same thing, but you're not. Totally different. So, when someone thinks they understand and they do not, that's very frustrating. That's where you build up. So we've got to know we don't know anything. So at least, you know, it's like, if someone hits you and you hit them back, or you hit a wall, both suffer. But if you punch a cloud, no pain, no problem, right? So that's why, again, we like to be a cloud. We will be more open-minded 
listening, not thinking we know. That's why you always have to work on the exercise to prove you don't know anything. So that becomes your habitual response. So you can never have an argument again once that's a habitual response. Okay? And even if you don't scream and yell in the argument, if you keep it inside, that's just as bad. Right? So don't say you don't yell and scream and you don't have arguments. You still do. Okay, next exercise. So whenever you're in an argument or observing other people, question yourself, do they understand you, which is always an easy one, but do you really understand them? When you think you understand, you have to be really sure. And the answer, the test answer is, are you still arguing? Because if you are, then no, you didn't understand them. So that's why we have to work on that. So it helps open your mind again. Because the open mind is an expanding mind. All right, next one. Are you getting tired? Do you need a break? Or should I keep talking? Keep talking? Yeah? Uh, oh, oh, a little bit more. Okay, a few more minutes. Um, words, yeah, less than an hour. Words have no value, no innate value in themselves, right? So, what I did before, si je parle français, tu comprends pas de français, je peux le dire que tout est, toutes tes grandes vaches sont tout fous, il n'y a pas de chance en vie que tu vas être un succès. Et c'est bon, avec un sourire, hein, tout est joli, oui? Right? So, that was fine, nice, wasn't it? Uh, but what I said was, if you don't speak French, I could say you're all a bunch of big fat cows, you're completely crazy, stupid, and there's not a chance in your life that you'll be any form of success. But I say it with a smile, you don't know. You see, words have no value. Only value is what you put in your mind, how you interpret the words. So, the problem is, we interpret words, we take it personally, we think we know what it means. And then we hang on to it, and the anger builds. It's like the two monks, they were walking a long time ago when it was just paths in the forest, and there was a little depression in the path, and it rained, so there's a lot of muddy, big muddy patch in the middle of the path, and this beautiful young woman in a nice long gown and nice shoes standing there trying to figure out how she's going to cross the path. And as these two monks approached, one realized what's going on, so he picks her up, carries her across, puts her down on the other side, and they all go their way. Not a word is spoken. Later that night, the two monks are having their dinner, and one monk says to them, he explodes, he says, how could you, how could you carry a girl? Where are your vows? We're not even supposed to look at women, and you carried her, how could you do that? And the other one says, look, I put her down on the path. How come you're still carrying her? So observe that. Now the reason you do that is because you take the words and give them meaning in your own mind. All right? Now, words are just a knife on the table. Words are just a knife that you put on the table, somebody put on the table. You can leave the knife there and not get upset. And the way to do that, when any, someone is attacking you, insulting you, whatever it is, how to leave the knife on the table is to remember something. Is there a human being who has no pain and suffering in their life? Everyone has got some pain, right? When you're in pain, have you ever yelled at somebody? that's not really a valid screaming, yelling? Because you're expressing your pain, your frustration at something else, but you vent it here. So if you remember when someone is giving you shit in any form, what happened to them this morning? Did he or she find out their partner, their, their spouse is having an affair? Did he have a car accident? Did he lose his job? Did he have cancer? You don't know what's going on in somebody else's life. So if anytime someone is venting at you, you bear in mind that you don't know the pain and suffering that they are enduring, and that there probably is something venting, you receive with compassion. You say, give me more, let it out, it's okay. So that's why we want to become a cloud, you see? Because we don't take things personally. And then somebody can vent their pain and frustration on you, and you can take it and that makes it easier for them. Again, this in your relationships or in your business. If you can be this way, you become somebody everyone wants to work with, everyone wants to be with. Or you can do the typical human thing, which is stick it in your own heart, because humans love being a drama queen. 
Oh, poor me, look what they did to me. Oh my God, poor me, blah, blah, blah. Right? We love it. Terrible. You can leave it on the table. You don't need to be the drama queen. Okay? And just remember, every human being has the birthright to be as stupid as they possibly can. So if someone's being racist, you can say, he has the right to be stupid. He has the right to be a racist. I have the right not to be a racist. If someone wants to be dumb, he has a right to be dumb. I have a right not to be dumb. So when we give people the right to be stupid and realize that words, unless I ate a lot of garlic and I'm right in your face, the words can't hurt you, then you become more of a cloud, you see? All right? And here's a picture for you. When someone's giving you shit, if you have ever had a little baby, or you can imagine this, you take a little baby and he changes diapers, clean him up, 20 minutes cleaning him, tie a little bow, so pretty, so nice, and as soon as you finish, <laughs> fills it again. What are you gonna do? Ah, stupid baby, out the window. <laughs> Give me a new one, this one's defective. <laughs> oh, you change it again, right? Age does not imply maturity and wisdom. So anytime someone's giving you shit unreasonably, remember, they just fill their diapers. And that should help you deal with it. All right? Nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. All right? So here's a little thing. When my, my, okay, I, we moved to Malaysia with my partner, and there was this Indian guy, older guy, wealthy, successful businessman, intelligent. And this guy, no matter what you tell him, he'd say, nice, nice. You know, I got a new car, nice, nice. Moved house, nice, nice. Everything, nice, nice. So anyway, I hadn't seen him for a few months. He had gone back to India and he came back and I'm alone now. And he says, oh, how are you? He says, how's Jenny? I said, she died a few months ago. He goes, nice, nice. <laughs> now I could give him shit. But I realized he's a robot. It's automatic, doesn't think. He can be stupid. That's okay. Right? When we observe the reality of human beings through observing ourself, we become much more compassionate, not so much anger, not so much fights and conflicts. All right? So, ah, sorry, there's a lot more slides than I thought. Okay, here's your exercise. Observe yourself attacking people. Observe yourself giving shit to people and think, was that necessary? It's human nature to vent pain. I vented my pain. And when other people are yelling at me, they're venting their pain. So when you observe yourself doing this wrong thing, you will become better. But the most important thing is you become more of a cloud for when other people are giving you shit. All right? So you observe yourself when you are attacking. Like the boss yells at you. He's not mad at you as much as he's scared. If you don't do the good job, he won't get his bonus. You've got to remember what he's really yelling at. All right? So consider this whenever you feel fear, conflict, anger, um, insecure. Just think about these three things. They don't mean to attack you personally. They're in pain about something and you are misinterpreting it. It's not about you. It's about them venting their pain. Okay? Now, this is a picture. You should take this picture, or again, I'll send you the slides. These questions you ask yourself every night before you go to sleep. What did I do well today? Today, somebody was yelling at me. I didn't react badly. Um, what did I do that I should... What? What did I do today that I should not have done? I behaved like a robot. I yelled at someone inappropriately. What didn't I do today that I should have done? I could have helped Auntie carry the bags out of the shop, but I didn't want to waste time. What did I do that I could have done better? I got my coworker a coffee, but I could have bought him a muffin or a cookie, but I was being cheap. Did I do anything out of revenge? That's pretty easy. And what do I want to do tomorrow? Tomorrow I want to be a cloud. I want to tell my partner I love them more often. So you have your own answers. And every night you review these five questions. And you'll see if you do this every day for a year or so, you're going to be a very different person. It really sinks in and changes you on a subconscious level. Okay, we're almost done. So in summary, never about you personally. You do not learn because you think you know. 
You are constantly deceiving yourself with self lies. You are not really who you think you are. You're not real. Companionship is everything. The subconscious is in control. Words have no innate value other than in your mind. And boundaries, fixed opinions, political correctness puts you in a bubble. All right? So let me just end this, this section here with a little story. Good intentions. Also, you should remember, a lot of times people have good intentions. I had one student, he was a photographer. One day, his six-year-old put all his cameras in a bucket of water. Not good. Why'd you do that? I want to help daddy. I want to wash his cameras. He wanted to wash the cameras. What are you going to do? Okay, this is a true story. In India, I was in India a long time ago. Small town. And I went to the train station. I wanted to book a ticket. I said, please, I want to buy a ticket to go to this other town tomorrow. And the man says, no need book tickets, sir. Many train. You come tomorrow, many seat, many train. You come tomorrow, buy ticket. I said, no, I'd like to book my ticket now, please, because I'd feel better, you know, reserved. No, sir, you come tomorrow. No problem. Tomorrow you come buy ticket. Please, I want to book it. Goes on and on. No way. He's not going to sell me the ticket. All right. So I check out of the hotel the next day, go with my bag. Same guy, same place, same train station. Same guy is there. And uh, I said, I'd like the ticket to go there. He says, no train today, sir. <laughs> Yesterday, you told me there'd be a train. Yes, sir, I told you there'd be a train, but there is no train this day of the week. What do you mean no train this day of the week? I, I packed my bag. I checked out. I checked the, booked the new hotel. I have to go. Give me a ticket to go there. No, sir. On this day of the week, there is never a train. You come tomorrow. Tomorrow, there is train. Not today, sir. <laughs> ah, so this goes back and forth. I'm getting really steaming here, really frustrated, long before I became a cloud. Um, really angry, and I said, so why, why, if you knew there would not be a train today, why did you tell me there would be? I did not want to get you upset. <laughs> okay, take a break, and 15 minutes or so, and we'll start again. All right, so I don't get you upset. I would have questions, but we'll, we'll do questions when you come back, because I think you need a little break now I talked. Right, so we'll continue. Now, let's start with uh, if you have any questions from all the first part. Wow, I'm an amazing teacher. No <laughs> question. I am so clear. Amazing. Mm. Yeah, maybe so confusing you can't even formulate a question, right? All right, ah, there. I knew there was one more. Okay, so any question? No questions? Yes? No? Okay, so we'll keep going now. All right. Now, remember, all my work, everything is about your mind. It's the state of your personality. I'm, I, if you want to learn how to trade the stock market, I can teach you that. That's a separate course. If you want to have better relationships, we can focus on that. That's a separate topic. But tonight, is about your mind, okay? So just bearing that in mind, that everything is the state of your mind and how that affects your success in work, in business, in relationships, and self-esteem, okay? All right, so now we're gonna, we talked all about the blocks. We built a nice house, but there's no furniture yet. Uh, the cause and the solution of our blocks. The, the reason we have our emotional blocks this, this is more getting into the, um, from our youth, emotional scars, our fears, our inhibitions. Every emotional obstacle you face now as an adult is due to something in your youth that happened and has affected you in a way that you are now dealing with life as the person you're formed into. I believe, and having tested it with my students, that in understanding how you got damaged, let's say, because you're not a free bird, you're not totally creative, you're not achieving your highest potential, so we'll say you're damaged, you're limited, you're in a prison, you think you're free, but you're not. In understanding how you got damaged, you're learning how your mind works, why you got damaged, and 
It's not something that's an epiphany now, but it is an instantaneous healing after a lot of work. It's like I can climb to the peak of a mountain in one step after I've done a thousand steps getting up to the peak, right? So the principles I'll explain to you now to continue on are things that you need to think about and observe through the exercises so that there is a slow but gradual realization of how you acquired your limitations and your inhibitions and your fears and so on. And as soon as you really accept that, then you will be free. Okay? And it's all based on experience, doing it with a lot of people, doing it myself and so on. All right? So that's now our second part. All right, so what happened? And why did it happen? When you were young, you were told a lot of things, right? Uh, you're stupid, you're not good, you'll never succeed you're ugly, whatever it is. All kinds of things they told you. Remember how my mother and her generation were told breast milk is bad for the baby. They believed that. You believed a lot of things too. You may not even remember what they are. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But the point is, you are who you are because of things you were told which you believe. Right? Now you may be conscious of them, you may not. Now the reason you believed what you were told is because you feel important. And this is the cause of almost all suffering. So many people suffer in their life because I need to do something important. I need to prove that I exist, that I was here, that I lived. I need to establish me. I am here. I was here. This begins when you're about two years old. For parents, it's called the terrible twos. I don't have kids, but I've heard enough stories. That's why I don't have kids. But, <laughs> and I was a kid once, I remember. Um, no, no, no. Always saying no. I'm asserting my realization that I am real. I exist. I'm an individual. And you know what? I'm tired of being told when to pee, when to poo, when to sleep, when to eat. I'm told everything. And I've come, you come to a realization at one point where, yeah, but what if I don't want to? And you start to fight back. And you start to feel important. I exist. I want to be acknowledged as an individual. I am important. Then you get a little older, and they all ask you, what are you going to be when you grow up? And you say, I want to... Uh, I want to, what was it someone said? I want to sell tickets on the bus. I want to be the one selling the tickets on the bus. Or in Canada, they usually say, I want to ride on the garbage truck because it looks like fun. And then you're told, no, you don't want that. You want to be someone important. You want to be famous. Americans all think ridiculously so, but they believe anyone can be president. Now they're starting to prove that. Any idiot can be president. <laughs> yeah, you know what? <laughs> if he can do it, I can do it. So, you're told you've got to be someone important. Aren't you going to be a, a famous lawyer, a doctor, and invent cures for terrible diseases, and a great musician? Don't you want to be that? So you get to be more important. Remember that when you're a mountain, you're a target. And so when something happens, it happened to you. They meant to get you. But reality is, nothing that happened to you happened to you. You were just the unlucky victim. Everything. Or you were the, uh, the lucky recipient. For example, if you happen to win the lottery, do you really believe that somebody said, ah, it's your turn? We're going to give you the lotto. No, it was just random chance. It's luck. The same thing goes with bad luck, like a car accident. A few months ago, I was in New Zealand. I'm driving along a thoroughfare. I have the right of way, and it's a T intersection. And some guy runs the stop sign and destroyed my car. Lucky no one was hurt. So what do you think? The guy was sitting there at the stop sign, and he's waiting. Cars are going. Cars are going. Oh, there's David. Okay. <laughs> 
Eh, no. Right? But you think, why does it happen to me? This ego, self-importance. So when my father used to beat me all the time, for some reason, I don't know why, but I am blessed with having seen he's nuts. I always saw that. I said, this guy's crazy. But what happened if you were beaten, punished, whatever? Didn't you feel that I'm bad, I'm bad, I'm terrible, that's why they're punishing me? A lot of people take it personally. And that's the whole point, right? They want to punish you to make you feel bad and guilty so they can control you. That's the point. It's not making you learn. It's to put you down so they're in control, right? Parents always say, I, I gave a talk last week to parents in a preschool, and a few of them are saying, you know, my kid is driving me crazy. I can't get them to do what I want. And I say, excuse me, are they your slave? You went and purchased them at the slave market? You want to have little slaves or do you want to have little individuals growing up? But you see, we don't think that. We always, and this is what happened to you. You took it personally. They made you take it personally so they could control you. And that destroys your self-esteem. And it limits your potential to think. And you've got hurt and you've got your scars. See, I don't have the scars. Nobody will talk to my father. None of the relatives will talk to him because he's just not a nice guy. I visit him. I'll go, I'll spend a month, I'll sleep on the floor of his second room because he doesn't have an extra bed. And I'll do that. Why? I have compassion for him because he's an old guy and no family will talk to him. I'm the only one. Why don't I have any problems with him for having beaten me all the time for no reason whatsoever, among other things? Because I could see it's not about me. Something is hurting him. And I happen to be the small one he can take it out on. Now, when you start to think about this, everything that happened to you didn't happen to you. You put your tent under a tree, and it's an old tree. And when you were sleeping, the wind blew, the tree fell on you. The tree didn't really want to kill you. It just fell over. You put your tent there. Bad luck. So it's the same thing. My bad luck, I was born named David to him who was having a tough time financially and other problems. Everything is just a matter of luck, of circumstance, okay? But we want to feel important. I want to feel that I matter. So when you do this to me, you did it to me. You are trying to put me down. And yes, they tried to put you down, but it wasn't about you personally. All right, so this is the whole point. All your emotional wounds and scars that have made you believe the person you are today is because you took everything personally, as if it was about you. But the truth is it wasn't. It's never about you. You're not that special, right? How many successful speakers tell their audience, you're really nothing, you're not that special, right? That's why it's only got 20 people here. <laughs> so, but I'd rather give you the truth. I want to give you freedom. Do you know I figured out something after being cheated by a lawyer? Uh, never take the advice of someone who will profit from your loss. So when you have these teachers and authors and this and they charge a lot of money for their courses, they don't actually want you to be free. They don't actually want you to be healed, whatever they promise, because they want you to keep coming back for the next course. You know Deepak Chopra? In, in America, they call him Deep Pockets Chopra. So rich. Arrogant bugger. I met him off camera, personally. Not a very nice guy. And you know his method? Is he writes a book, and in the beginning, he says, in this book and in this course, you will learn. Tak, 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 tak. And you pay a lot of money for it. And at the end, it says, and in the next book, you will learn the same things. Because he never tells you anything. That way, you buy the next book. Take the next course. Right? That's why I don't do this as a business. So I can tell you what I think. So the solution is, it didn't happen to you. And you have to take 100% responsibility for your emotions. So basically, you didn't know it, 
But when you were young, everything you endured that was in some way negative about you, you took that knife and you stuck it in your own heart. So you have to now, as an adult, logically, and this is where we use logic and reason, every, every faculty has a useful purpose, logic and reason to think back of all the things you believe about yourself, where that came from, as far back as you can remember, and that you say, okay, it wasn't about me, they were angry, they were scared, they were whatever, they needed to have power, so reduce me so they feel stronger, right? That's the American way. Like Trump said, we've got to stop China from their 2025 initiative to be a leader in technology. Because if we don't stop them, they'll beat us. And I'm thinking, why don't you just try to make yourself better and compete? But you see, American way is instead of me working on myself, I'm just going to kill the other guy. Sorry, Americans. Okay. So it's kill the other guy. So this is what people do in their own way. So you've got to realize this is human nature. It's much easier to step on someone's head than it is to pull yourself up. So it's not personal and that you have to take responsibility that although you were innocent and didn't realize it, still you stuck the knife in your own heart. This is the way you heal your blocks and inhibitions. Now any obstacle in your life that's preventing you from a relationship, from finding someone to love, from truly opening your heart so you can melt inside another person in every way, physically, emotionally, to be able to really hug hug someone and just melt inside them. This thing that you only see in the movies. To succeed in business, to be able to really feel, you can't do that if you have all these emotional blocks and inhibitions and fears and distorted ideas about yourself. So it is as simple as, it's difficult but you have to do it, as understanding the cause of your blocks so you remove the blocks and like the blanket on the light, when you remove it, the light shines. So in order to overcome your obstacles, you have to remove those things which are being your obstacles. Rather than trying to say, I've got to find a different job, I've got to find a different partner, I've got to move to another country. Okay? As best as you can. So here's how you remember that. Animals attack for self-preservation. A human being is the only creature, and mainly Americans, again, sorry Americans, who attacks for pleasure. Of all my 81 countries, the one I felt the most dangerous was the US, because you never know when you're getting shot. And they all walk around with guns, it's amazing. I'm Canadian, right? We don't have guns. So animals attack for self-preservation. Only humans attack for pleasure. Do you know the part of the body that is the most common part of the body that gets a snake bite? It's the hand, yeah. Do you know why? Because you're out there and you put your hand over there and you don't look and there's a snake there and the poor snake is there and it sees somebody else coming in. So it's ah, bite your back. Self-preservation. Can you get angry at the snake for biting you? Of course you will and then you want to kill it. But you can't really, it's not fair. I do not believe that the way to heal your emotional pains of the past is to go back and blame your parents. Blaming this one, blaming that one. No, there's no point. They were just acting out of their distorted idea of self-preservation. Out of their needs. So you are responsible for your pain. I know that sounds terribly ridiculous, but this is the way to be free. You know why? Because if I blame my mother or my father or whoever, Peter Pan, for my pain, and they don't agree, I'll never be healed. Right? Like Buddha said, if someone gives you a gift and you do not accept it, who does it belong to? Right? It's the giver. So if I'm trying to put the responsibility on them and they don't accept it, I'm stuck with it. Can't, they don't do it. But if I accept responsibility because I didn't know better, how many things do we do as a kid and as an adult that you don't know better and you screw up? If I accept that, which is an obvious reality, I am now in control of my pain and my healing.
because I'm not putting it on somebody else. Every relationship you've had, every boy or girl who's hurt you, who broke your heart, whatever it is, in some way, you were responsible. You participated. And even if you weren't, if you will accept that you were responsible, you don't know how maybe, you're in control. Because you now hold that knife. So you can put it down. All right? So that's the principle. Everything they did to you was in self-preservation. My mother screwed me for a lot of money. My father stole a lot of money from me. Both of them. Well, I'm not angry. Because they felt they needed it. And you know what? All you women, I don't know if any of you are prostitutes, but I know you all would be. I guarantee I, any of you will become a prostitute. And I know the men would love to be, so we won't talk about them. But if you have three kids and you're a single mother and they're sick and they're starving and you have no other way to make money to, to, to provide for your kids, you would probably be a prostitute if that's your only choice. Right? Do you agree? If you're pushed to that, to protect your children. So we'll do anything to survive. So all you have to do is think about it, that there was a limit to whatever your parents or anybody could take, that they were pushed to that limit. And that forced them to do whatever they did to you. So if you're scared of doing business because you got cheated or you hear people are crooks, so, oh, no, no, I'm going to take a job. I'm going to live in a corporate job because when you're in business, you get cheated, you get crooked and all of this stuff because you're, you're scared of what people did, but you're not accepting, well, everyone's out to survive. It's not that they're evil. So you have to understand that's how the game is played and then you'll be out to survive, but you don't have to be as evil, right? So you don't have to have any fear when you realize the truth. No one wants to hurt you. They just need to survive. Okay, so there is the reason for all of your emotional pains, blocks, and fears. You took it personally. You feel it's about you. And when you realize it had nothing to do with you, you will be a cloud. That is how to become a cloud. It had nothing to do with you. You can't hurt me. You can't touch me. I can hurt me. I can stick the knife in my own heart, but you can't. I did it always. All right? So... You cannot be emotionally hurt when someone cheats you, when someone hurts you, when someone breaks your heart. Of course you will be, but you have to separate that from the self-pity drama queen. That's the difference, okay? So now, here's the next point. This is the most powerful exercise and phrase to have great freedom. You are totally irrelevant. Right? Another really anti-popular concept. Everyone's saying how great you are. You're totally irrelevant. A cloud is irrelevant. Why? It comes, it goes, it moves, it forms, it deforms. A mountain is very relevant. I fly. I'm a single engine, small planes, right? I'm a pilot. And I know clouds I can go through. Mountains, got to avoid. <laughs> Don't go near a mountain. So every night, when the sky is clear, go out there and look at the stars and think, what I can see is nothing compared to what's out there. And I'm standing on a sphere, right, Earth? It's a sphere. It's a ball. And it's in the middle of a whole lot of stars. So every spot I stand on Earth, which is a lot of different spots, that's a whole new group of stars that goes out for infinity. And around each of those stars, there's planets. And on each of those planets, there's people or creatures or God knows what. Ask Star Wars. They'll tell you what's out there. And so how relevant am I? So you need to let that sink in. We are not, you as an individual, are not that important. When one grain of sand is removed from the beach, it didn't change the beach. Now, you might say that's negative. That, oh my God, that's depressing. I'm nothing. But it's free. Now I'm free. I don't have to worry about anything or anybody. I don't have all these massive responsibilities to worry about. Take care of what I need to, but it puts life in perspective and allows you not to be so concerned. Now, I had, as I said, I've been in over about 30 businesses. And the reason I could do that and take chances 
the courage I had as an entrepreneur is because I knew I'm irrelevant and everything ultimately is irrelevant. And since I'm not scared of image, I don't care if I fail. I happen to never have failed. So, but I don't worry about failure. Maybe that's why I never failed in a business. But it doesn't matter what anyone thinks of me. I'll float away, whatever it is. So this is, you know, a coin has, they think two sides, right? No, a coin has three sides because there's the edge. But when you have a coin on one side and you flip it, well, you have the other side, right? So are you relevant? Are you irrelevant? So when I'm relevant, I'm a mountain. The more I become irrelevant, the more I become a cloud, right? So it's the same thing. If I'm a mountain, I'm a target and I suffer. If I'm a cloud, I'm free and I can do anything. So being irrelevant is very positive. It frees you of all your cultural limitations and beliefs. All right? So when you become irrelevant, you have no more fears of rejection. So when you work with everything that happened to me wasn't to me personally, it was my body the being the person I was, the target, easy to hit, mountain, all right? It's not personal, so now I can be free. I don't have to feel that it's about me. Now I'm irrelevant, so I'm not a target for anything. I can do anything I want because what I do is not really that important. I don't have to take care of the whole world. Now I can be creative. Now I can travel. Now I can experience life. Now I can take chances. So, you know, there's one famous guy I mentioned before, Buddha. Think about this with the idea of irrelevance. Buddha was a prince, right? This rich, super powerful prince. And he was a prince in his kingdom, which there are other kingdoms. Then he became irrelevant. He became a penniless beggar wandering the streets where no one knew who he was. And through the making himself of irrelevant, became a Buddha. I, I, when I was young, I was a nobody. So I wanted to be a somebody. So I became rich and I became a somebody. I was a famous guy in Montreal. And then I realized that, you know what? Being a somebody separates you. So now I wanted to become nobody again so I could be one with everybody. So irrelevance is saying the mountain is, let's say, ice, an iceberg, can sink the Titanic. The ice melts, becomes water. Water evaporates, becomes air. So who can feel more? Who can experience more, an iceberg or air? Right? So that's the idea. You've got to get this idea that it is not a negative concept to become irrelevant. I owned, uh, when I was 25, I owned eight companies. Three stores, a factory, international trading, real estate, different things, right? How could I run eight companies at the same time? I had employees. Very simple. I build a company, I make myself irrelevant. I was totally useless. So that way I was free to go wherever I was needed. If I walk into one of my, I had one of our photo stores with some of my businesses. I walk in, it's very busy, everyone's working away, the garbage cans are piling up. I would take out the garbage. Doesn't matter, I'm irrelevant. I'll do whatever needs to be done. All right? So being irrelevant makes you flexible makes you able to do all kinds of things, all right? I'm trying to get you to understand that words that appear negative is your interpretation of a word based on how you're formed to interpret it, give it a meaning, but every word might have a totally different meaning. This is how you're gonna open your mind up to being more creative, okay? So, freedom is an accepting, there's nothing real about you, as we said before, you are born a sponge, right? Your mind is a sponge and it absorbs the water, which is the events of your life. So they're good or bad, clean or muddy. Good things happen to you, bad things happen to you. But you absorb that. Now the problem is you think you are the water instead of realizing you're the sponge. So you've identified yourself with your culture, with your memories, with your emotions, as if that's you. And you've forgotten that, you know what? We can. Squeeze the sponge, rinse it out, and put new water in. I can be totally different. I can talk like an Indian. You can do anything. All right? 
So this is very important to realize that your obstacles are believing you're the water, you're the events, when in reality you can be back to being the sponge. So this exercise, to get that to sink in, think of all your likes and dislikes, everything, what kind of food you like, your opinions, your religion, your culture, language, accent, everything about you. And then who in your family is the same? So how did a child form its opinions? Because it copied. You learned. You copied. Right? Your handwriting, you might find some parts of your handwriting identical to your parents. Do this exercise. List everything about you and then, oh, mother like this, father like this, uncle like this, this movie star. Look how kids sometimes they wear their hat, you know, with the brim on the side. Looks cool, huh? No, it looks stupid. A brim is there to cover from the sun. What are you putting it on the side? This is stupid. But it looks cool. Or their pants hanging down like they pooed. You know, I see that. I don't know. You, I don't see it here too much. But in America, this is hanging down. <laughs> cool, huh? <laughs> yeah. Copying, yeah? Because they think, why? If I act like the famous movie star or the famous sports guy, people will like me. Need of companionship makes you do the stupidest things. Okay? So, this exercise is just to break your attachment to thinking you're the water and realize you're the sponge. That there's nothing real about you. Right? And here's a very important one, because everybody likes this. You're awesome. You're amazing. You're fantastic. You're great. Right? This is a big thing. Hype, hype, hype. No, you're not awesome. If you're awesome, you're a big mountain. And you know what? When you're the most awesome person in the company or in your department, a lot of people hate you. <laughs> the more awesome you are above others, the bigger target you are. And what happens when you're a target? Paranoia sets in. Everyone hates me. They're all out to get me. Right? That's what happens when you're awesome. So all of this stuff that's out there is counterproductive to you being a creative, independent individual. And it's for a good reason. There's a joke about the American president talking to the Israeli president. I don't know how much you know about Israelis and Jews, but you'll get the joke, I'm sure. The American president is saying, oh, such a headache. I have 350 million citizens to worry about. And the Israeli president says, that's nothing. I got 4 million presidents I got to worry about. Because Jews like to be the boss. Everyone's the boss. So New Zealand, the, the culture, is the most emotionally repressed culture I've seen in the whole world. Because the government makes you very insecure. They make rules where you're not allowed to make decisions. Like for example, in New Zealand, it's illegal to make a lease for a home more than one year. You cannot make more than one year. If it's more than one year, it's not valid. And I asked the tenancy bureau, why do you do that? My tenant wants to stay five years, I want them to stay five. He says, no, no, you can't do that because you don't know what you're going to want to do in one year from now. So we don't let you make any commitments longer than a year. Can you imagine? I'm a grown up, what do you mean? I don't know. It happened that those tenants had little kids and they wanted the house so the kids can go to this particular school in that school zone. So they knew they wanted to be there for at least 10 years, but they weren't allowed more than one year. Because the government tells you, you're not smart enough to know. All right? So this whole idea of you're awesome, of, of political correctness, of boundaries, it's for a very good reason. It's trying to keep you limited. Because it's very hard when the population far outnumbers the police force to keep that population under control. So you need to be weak. So you're easy to control. So I guess they're going to shoot me one day for all this, right? So, I want you to be in control. So you're not awesome, you're not great, you're irrelevant. You're a cloud, not a mountain, all right? So I'm asking you to reject all of these concepts, right? And this is why you have all your emotional wounds. Because when you were little, they told you how important you are, how awesome you are, how amazing you are. And you built your ego. 
and then everything that happened to you happened to you. And you took it personally. Okay? So that is where your emotional pains and scars came from. And that's how to get rid of them. All right? So just a little story about why a fellow never married. This old guy, his friend says, how come you never married? He says, you know, I thought about it once. And I looked for a good woman. And I found a girl, beautiful, but oh, arrogant. And I found another one, beautiful and sweet, but terrible homemaker. And then another one, she was a great homemaker and very loving, but ugly, ugly, oh, God, ugly. And I kept looking. Then I found the perfect woman. She was beautiful and smart and loving and affectionate and a great homemaker. Perfect. He says, so why didn't you marry her? He says, ah, she was looking for the perfect man. So I've spent the last 15 years trying to make myself worthy. Yeah. So your subconscious always knows the truth. The conscious likes to think. The subconscious knows the truth. When you're telling yourself you're awesome and your subconscious, going back to let's say the soul or spirit or something like that, which is humble and realizes that it's part of everything, there's an inner conflict, the conscious and the subconscious. And when they're debating and arguing, that causes confusion. Confusion, like, I'm awesome. And then you do something stupid, like you leave your keys in the door. One fellow, he used to, every time he came, because he's used to not having to lock his door. So when he traveled to visit me in Penang, he stayed in an apartment where he, you have to use a key, proper key, to open the door. And every time he would come, he'd put the key in the lock, open the lock, and go inside. And the key stayed in the lock outside. He'd never remember to take the key out of the lock. And boy, he felt stupid because he had a habit of not having to do that. So when your subconscious and your conscious are fighting and there's a conflict, it destroys your self-esteem. Now remember the beginning, the first slides, that your self-esteem supports your success in business and relationships. All right? So your subconscious always knows the truth. Okay? Now the subconscious is really powerful. I had a dream once. As I said, I trade on the stock market. And it's in New York, so 12 hour time difference, right? Closes at 4 a.m. our time here. And I, so I go to sleep before the market closes, close the computer. I wake up in the morning and I have a dream. The market was flat, 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 and the last half hour of the day, it just shot up in my dream. I wake up, I open the computer, I look at the chart, and exactly what I saw in my dream. How could I have known that? I wish it happened the night before. Could have made money, but how about when you have to wake up very early the next morning, earlier than normal, and you set the alarm for 5 o'clock, and you wake up one minute before 5? Right? Everybody gets that? How does that work? Observe these sort of things to prove to yourself that there's a subconscious that knows something more than your conscious knows. And that all your self-esteem is eroded because there's a conflict saying, I'm awesome. No, I'm just normal. And when the self-esteem is gone, your success in business, your success in relationship goes. Right? Who wants to hire somebody who's very insecure? They're not going to move you up to the C-level of the company because you're insecure. They can't trust you. Who wants to date someone who's always doubting themselves, unless they're a very arrogant, controlling person? But who wants that? No, you want strong confidence. So your success is based on your self-esteem. Self-esteem is based on not telling yourself lies. Okay? Now, do you know what a human being is? Do you know what a dust ball is? You know the dust bunny when you clean the floor and you get in the corner all the threads and hairs and this, right? Take one of those next time you find one. Pull out every hair, every thread, every bit of dust, one by one. Pull everything out. What do you have left? Nothing, right? So what held it together? Because something held them all together because they're all laid out all over the floor now. Static electricity. Now, in scientific terms, it's called atmospheric potential. I'll teach you a little science now. For every one meter above the ground, there's 100 volts of electricity. Two meters, 200 volts. Three meters, 300 volts. This is called atmospheric potential. 
if you are ever in um, you know, countries like Montreal, you get static shock touching some metal, right? You might have experienced that. It's the static electricity that held the dust and threads together. Now, when you take it apart, where'd the electricity go? Back to the atmospheric potential that surrounds the whole planet. So the subconscious knows I'm irrelevant. My conscious ego, me, is the dust ball. But I am the electricity and therefore have the ability to be part of a greater all. So the more you think about this in observing the foolishness of your individuality, the more you get to expand your mind, the better your heart can open. And that means you'll be a really good salesperson. Because when you go to make a sale, when you go to work with people and you're there with an open heart, they feel good with you. They want to work with you. Like I said, my success is because people came to me. I never applied for a job in my life. People wanted to be with me because of this quality. All right. So that's where you get it. Now, freedom from fear is something I grew up with when I was a little kid. You know, Alexander the Great, maybe not personally, but you might have heard of him. When he was dying, he knew he was dying and he had three wishes. But the most important one is this. He said, when I die, leave my hands out of the casket in the profession, procession. And this is to show, here is Alexander the Great, world conqueror, born empty-handed, died empty-handed. That's how irrelevant you are. No matter what you achieve in life, you won't take it with you. But that attitude that the man had made him quite powerful, right? We still remember him how many millennia later. So again, that's the cloud because the cloud doesn't have hands. A mountain gets trees and rocks and it has gold and it has minerals and all this stuff. Possessions. Now I'm not saying not to have possessions, but I'm saying the attitude Remember always, you're irrelevant. You're going to die with nothing. The only thing you take with you, there is one thing you take, is your experiences. Okay? So, in order to have the best experiences, we have to be the cloud. We have to remove our obstacles and our blocks by knowing it never happened to us. I'm irrelevant. It was just my bad luck. I have no animosity, no blame, no resentment to anybody because they were just animals acting out of self-preservation. To which I do when I'm in pain and I yell at the kid at Starbucks. Are you making all the connections, I hope? Okay. So there's no need to prove that you're recognized and being remembered. Right? You don't have to prove you existed because in 100 years no one will know you existed anyway, no matter what you do. So don't strive to be respected. Strive to be worthy of respect. Confucius. Do not strive to be respected, but rather strive to be worthy of respect. That is power. That is true power. That's when everybody wants to be with you. Okay? And that happens when you see the irrelevance of your true nature. No one can hurt a cloud, but everyone remembers. Okay, there, we're done. Now, this, I, I've written a bunch of books. A couple of them are in print, but a bunch of them are ebooks, small, small ebooks. This one, just so you don't say, well, what did I get? I gave you some exercises. This is uh, 60 or so exercises I've created. So these are all to help you become free, to develop a better concentration, a better detachment, basically. I don't try to make money on my teaching. I do this because I want to see happier people in the world, all right? So I just, I think it's $4, $4.95, something like that, just a token to give me something for my work. Um, all my stuff is very, very cheap, just token stuff. So you can go to my website, entrepreneurmonk.com, on the books. You can buy that. It's an ebook. Email it to you. There's something I read, it's funny, by Vincent van Gogh. In one of his letters to his brother, when I read that, I said, ah, it's interesting because it's the same thing that since I'm four years old, I knew exactly what I'll do with my life. And it was always the same thought. He said, my only anxiety 
is how can I be of use in the world? Right? So that's why I, I teach. That's why I do this. Uh, so it's not a business for me. I, I just like to make people happier because I just want to be useful in the world. I, I make enough money. I know how to make money. I don't need money. So you can get everything I've said by habitual repetition. Okay? A human being is just a collection of habits. All you are is a collection of habits. And habits are formed by doing something repeatedly. And habits are broken by doing something different repeatedly. All right? So everything I said, you can totally change your life. You can become a cloud within a year. But you have to do things daily. You have to do the six questions daily. You have to do other exercises I've given you. And every exercise incorporates in your daily life. Because I don't believe you should have to sit for meditating two hours. I did that. I did 10 hours. I did 10 days once. Um, I don't believe in that. It's not our place in this world. So all the exercises I've invented are applicable in your normal daily life. Like for one thing I do when I brush my teeth, I have the electric toothbrush, which makes it a little easier to do this. So I'm brushing my teeth with this hand. I feel the sensation of the toothbrush. The other hand is tapping one finger very, very quickly. And I'm counting mentally from one to 10 very slowly. One, two, three, as I'm tapping and brushing. So my mind is split to physical movement, mental concentration, and awareness. All right? So that, I'm brushing my teeth anyway, right? Make use of the time. So there's a lot of exercises like that. They fit into your day. So if you want to make changes, that's a good thing to get. All right? There's another exercise one of the exercises is every month you will make one new habit and you will break one existing habit. And you don't give it up after a month. You, once you choose a habit to make and break, you stick with it. But every month, another one. So for example, if you take sugar in your tea or your coffee, no more sugar. All right. If you take coffee, switch to tea. If you don't drink a half a liter of water when you wake up. You start drinking a half a liter of water when you wake up. All right? Doesn't matter what they are. Because one of my courses and books I call The Anatomy of the Mind. So every mental faculty is like a physical organ of your mind. And one of the organs is a habit organ. So you have an organ that stores all your habits. And as you get older, it atrophies. It becomes very stiff. So you cannot change your habits, make new ones, so on. That's why they say an old dog can't be taught new tricks and old people are a pain in the ass. Right? So if you don't want to become an old pain in the ass, you have to change your habits. So that way you massage the habit organ. It becomes more flexible. Now, why that's important in life, especially in business or work, is that when shit hits the fan, as the expression goes, you can adapt. You get toilet paper. You deal with it. If the economy changes, like for example, one of my most successful businesses was one hour photo at the time when we used film. And I had two of those shops. I made a huge amount of money with those businesses. And then they invented digital. Before digital became mainstream or anything, I saw this is the end of photography. So I sold my businesses at a peak, did very well, and I didn't lose out because right now it's an extinct business film development, pretty much extinct, right? I adapted. Instead of saying, I'm making a fortune every year, I'm going to hang on, right? So that's why we need to get the habit organ flexible so we can adapt to changing situations. So you don't have a glass house in an earthquake zone, which is what generally people are, okay? So there's that. And basically, here we go. It may be difficult, but you have to do it anyway. That's my website. That's Sakura in the north of Japan. Absolutely beautiful. I love having freedom because I, I, I'm, you know, I'm based in Penang for a few years, last few years. And um, I wait. When is the best time? Wait, 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 because it's very quick. You can't predict exactly. And as soon as I found that it's just starting in the north of Japan, the Sakura season, I get on a plane and go. I have freedom. Now, you may say, no, I'm stuck in my job. I have limitations. Yes, because you believed that you need to be stuck in a job. But you can change anything. One of my students, he makes, he's a freelancer in his business in New Zealand. He made $260,000 last year. 
Guy makes over a quarter million dollars a year. The people at his level, and he's not very good at his job, he makes a lot of mistakes, but the people at his level make 50, 60,000. He makes over a quarter million. Why? He's not that good. He screws up every time on every job because he has the right ethics. He has the right attitude. People want to work with him. So when you say, oh, I wish I was rich. I wish I had more money, but I have to keep my job and blah, blah, blah. It's your attitudes. You're on the train track. So when you get off the train, you fly away, you're amazing how creative you can be. That's why I don't teach specifically here, do this business. Here's how to trade the stock market or whatever it is. Because every individual has to find their place. And it comes when you open your mind. All right? So there you go. Um, I, I love to talk. You might have noticed. Well, uh, because I'm alone all the time, right? So I have to talk to myself. It's much more fun talking to people. <laughs> you know what I love doing? I love going in Penang. I live in Penang. And on, there's a waterfront where I live. It's a nice walkway waterfront towards a marina there. I go for a walk sometimes at night when it's cool and I talk to myself. And I might tell a joke and I might find it funny and I'll start laughing and I'm alone. And then, of course, people look and they think I'm nuts, right? <laughs> and I find that so funny. I laugh even more. <laughs> because I don't care what people think of me. I know who I am. Oh, you know that? There's an Indian a joke in, in a movie I saw. This American guy and an Indian guy are arguing and the Indian is staying calm and the American is getting very frustrated. So at one point he says, you know, who do you think you are? You know, and somebody is very arrogant. Who do you think you are? He says, who do you think you are? And the Indian says, sir, in India, we don't think who we are. We know who we are. <laughs> when you know who you are, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you. That's the definition of freedom. Freedom is not being concerned with what anyone else thinks or says about you. Who's free here? Me, I am, anybody else? Right? There's another saying, the journey that would take you 200 years on your own will take you two days with an experienced guide. So be careful who you choose to learn from. Did they actually achieve what you want to learn? So that's why I can teach now. I'm free. And believe me, you can be amazed what you can do. Once you no longer have any more scars and healing and you fly out of the train. All right? So there you go. Go to my website. And it's easy, right? I was an entrepreneur and I was a monk. So entrepreneurmonk.com. Easy to remember. Um, and you can send me emails there. Uh, as I said, I love to talk. I don't care if it's two people. Invite me. The fee is buy me a coffee. Buy me a meal. That's the fee. All right? If we want to do the longer courses, which last a half a day or two days worth of time, then yeah, it might charge you 100 bucks. Okay? But I'm happy to do this. I want to do this. But one thing I do not do is market myself because I'm scared if I start telling you how wonderful I am, I might believe it. And then my ego gets bigger again. It was really big. It took a long time to bring it down. Um, so I don't market. So I ask from anybody, if you're interested, give me a call, send me an email, send me a text, invite me, and I'll go anywhere. Anywhere in the world. I don't care. I'll go and start talking. So if you want to learn more, continue. Short talks, long talks, whatever it is, all you've got to do is ask. All right? Because that's my life. I made myself free. Since I'm four years old, I knew what I wanted to do. I was very clear. And this is actually quite amazing. If you want to know, is there really something of knowing the future and stuff like that? When I was about four or five years old, I saw like a vision of different things that would happen in my life up to the age of 30. And things like 21, I was going to have a brand new Mercedes when Mercedes was an expensive car. Uh, 23, I'm going to have, what was it? 20, 21, I was going to have a Mercedes. 23, I was going to have my own business. 25, I'd be a millionaire. Whole bunch of things. Every year there was something different. And everything happened. And I always thought, oh, you know, retired by 28, all of this, you made it happen. You determined kid, right? But one of the things in that vision was, I'm going to walk into a bank, it's going to be robbed, there will be somebody robbing it, and he will shoot at me, but he will not hit me, and I will somehow kill him. And one day, when I was about, I think, 24 years old, I went lunchtime to the bank in Montreal, so it was a long walk from the shop, it was a beautiful summer day, I thought, I'll go to the bank. 
So it's about a 20, 30 minute walk. I walk to the bank in the middle of the city. I walked in, everyone's on the floor, and there's a guy with a gun robbing the bank. And I know how it works. When there's an armed robbery, the police come three minutes after the alarm. That way, they don't have a shootout. So the thief knows he's got three minutes, so they don't have to have a shootout, and then they'll just catch him later. I knew that. So I backed out before he saw me. And I waited. I thought, I'll follow him. I'll get a number plate off the car. I'll see where he goes. I can tell the police. So as I backed out, he walked out, and I followed him at a little distance. And as we were walking this way down the road, the police car was coming that way. So I waved down the cops, pointed him out. He was pissed off, so he shot at me, but missed. And then, of course, the police could shoot back and killed him. So when the bank robbery happened, just like in my vision, I said, wow, you know, there's really something more to this world than we realize. So maybe all these things are destiny. So the end of my vision was up to the age of 30. I'd retire, travel around the world, be a monk, and then I'd be teaching and devote my life to that. So that's what I like doing, all right? As I said, it's not a business. That's why I can tell you all these sort of negative things, right? The truth. So please, yeah, write to me, invite me, and uh, ask any questions, okay? When you think of them, in case you don't think of them now. And if you want copies of the video, of the audio, of the slides, again, just write to me and ask, okay? All right, so questions? I must be really boring. <laughs> really? Nothing? <gasps> Thank you. Yes. Oh, lovely. So if you're a cloud, and so what I'm hearing is if you're a cloud, you don't take on board any insults or being offended. Um, just playing devil's advocate, are you then giving people permission to insult What's the, the negative? Yeah, the, yeah the, the, uh, the danger of being a cloud. If you're really a cloud, there's no danger. If you, <laughs> sorry? So, uh, let, let me change danger to risk. Risk, okay. If you are lying to yourself and you think you're a cloud when you're really still a mountain. You know, that's one thing. When I was flying once and there were low clouds, <laughs> there might be a mountain in those clouds, all right? Then there's a danger. But if you truly are free, then yes, give me all your shit. Better give it to me where it does no harm than give it to someone else who's going to get hurt. So there is no, if you truly are, if you're lying to yourself and pretending, then you're keeping it inside and what happens, you eventually will explode. But if you sincerely have freed yourself and you uh, understood the principles, there is no negative. You cannot be harmed. All you do is give love and compassion. The downside is a lot more people are going to like to be around you. So you get a lot of pain in the ass that's always wanting to talk to you. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, that, that's the only thing. You'll be more popular, more in demand. You know the downside of being truly excellent in your career is you'll be so busy you have no time for yourself. Yeah. But it has to be sincere. Yeah. What do you mean? Add fire? What do you mean? When somebody is uh, like you being a cloud, it's okay to add a bit of fire. Oh, I don't understand. What do you mean add a bit of fire? You mean you want to dig them to get them all even worse? No, just protect yourself. You don't need to protect. You're a cloud. Nothing can hurt you. When you realize nothing can hurt unless he ate a lot of garlic and he's in your face, that'll kill you. But otherwise, his words can't hurt you. That's the point, is that we are untouchable, except in your own mind. Yeah, it's impossible to get me pissed off, except driving. Okay, but, but, when I'm driving, okay, 12 years with Jenny, the only thing she said is wrong with me or bad about me is when I drive, I get aggressive. Okay, but, and this is very important, I'm not saying to have no emotions. We have all the emotions. So when I'm driving, okay, when you're driving and someone cuts you off, you get angry, pissed off, and you stay pissed off all day, right? No. 
when I drive and they cut me off, I'm pissed off, really. And I'm yelling and screaming and cursing the bastard, and then I'm up fine, and everything is great. As soon as they are no longer bothering me, I am not angry anymore. So I'm not saying you never have emotions. You, in fact, you have more intense emotions, but you have it appropriately when the time is right. And not like the monk carrying her all day into the night. All right? So, but I, you can insult me all you want. I don't get bothered by what you think. So, does that sort of answer you? More or less. Okay. Yeah. No, it just when you get it, and it, it takes time. It takes time to get it. But when you get it, then, yeah, there's, you, you don't get bothered anymore. And then you have so much more energy, so much more vibrance. The beauty is that, okay, let's say this. There's a, a garden hose, and so much water can come out. Okay. Now, you can send out muddy water, or you can send out pure water. So when you have reduced your negative emotions, you can't help it, but you have more positive emotions. Your positive emotions are more intense. Your love is more pure. Your hug is more soft. Because it's just flipping the coin over. It's the same coin. All right? So, yeah. So you still have all the emotions. And then you can be angry appropriately. Okay. Something else? The, remember the dust ball? When everything is gone, that energy goes back to the hole. Right? You are relevant moment to moment wherever you need to be. Another thing I was raised with, our purpose in life, this is my religion, our purpose in life is to help as many people as we can, but above all, never hurt anyone. Okay. Now, I'll tell you about two mystical paths. One is in uh, Hindu philosophy, Indian philosophy, karma yoga. Karma yoga is the path of selfless service, right? Where you serve for the sake of serving. And you don't care that you get not only no acknowledgement, you don't mind if they give you shit for it, but you just do the best you can for the sake of doing the best you can. That's that boy with the quarter million dollar a year because he does the best job he can, not for the pay, but to do the best he can, just to have done something good. So this is, is what we're doing, is you take a pride in yourself, knowing that wherever I needed to help, wherever there was something to do, I did it, and I did it well. And what you get is self-esteem. You get very healthy self-esteem, which is much better than credit, much better than acknowledgement because then you don't need it. You see, the problem with needing acknowledgement is you are now a prisoner and dependent on other people to give you acknowledgement. So now you become fearful because I have to make sure I get my acknowledgement from other people. So you're a mountain. But if my self-esteem is healthy, I know who I am and I do everything I can and I feel good about myself. I don't need you to tell me I'm good. I'm free, I'm independent. Right? So this is how it works, is that, y y yeah, you don't need anything any anymore. Does that answer you a little bit, more or less? Or ask it again. I even forgot what you asked, actually, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Told you I like talking a lot. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Because things need to be done. Your children need to be fed. You, you might have a job which is totally pointless, but it serves a purpose. Look at the world. This is the most ridiculously stupid planet in the universe. Okay? Look what we do. We go to work to make money, to, to, and our job is building iPhones. And we go to work to build the iPhones, so we have money to buy iPhones. What a ridiculous life we live. What kind of a world is this? We do stupid jobs to make money so that other people have a stupid job to do something so we can buy from them. It just keeps things going, keeps us busy. Now, if you want to know the purpose of why humans exist, that's a whole other topic. But meanwhile, in our day-to-day -day lives, so we're relevant because we basically keep the wheel rolling. We keep people 
occupied. We keep life moving along. But I personally am irrelevant. If I don't buy that phone, someone else will. Now, what is the most best, best thing you can do in the world? What do you think the best thing you can do in the world is? No. Huh? Ah, close. Make other people happy. Making other people happy. That's what we can do. Now, who has got a better chance of making people happy? A mountain or a cloud who can go anywhere? Someone who's just happy to help. I want to do the best I can just to make you happy. Right? When you give the little kid an ice cream cone and the kid's got it all over their face and they're loving it, you enjoy it more than the kid did. It's, that's, that's it. That's my, only my only purpose is make people happy. I've done everything I want. I'm irrelevant. I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I, I do. Okay, I want a girlfriend now. Someone, you know why I want a girlfriend? I want a partner? So I have someone to do nice things for. Oh, sorry. Did that get a lot of interest? Okay. <laughs> but really, actually, I thought about it a couple of weeks ago. I was walking around the shopping malls. How nice. And I thought, you know what? It'd be so nice to make someone happy. Take her around. Buy her a lunch. And, and you know what? I'm no different than any of you. Every human being is exactly the same thing. All you want is to make someone happy. And you can't do it as a mountain because you're stuck there. And you're worried about you. So the more irrelevant you are, the less it's about me and more about what I can give for you. And that is the most relevant life you can live. Right? So that's why the coin, you know? The more irrelevant I am, the more valuable I am the more useful, the more relevant you become. Does that make better sense? Yeah, okay. So that's why I say, what matters most? <laughs> Arthritis. What matters? Everyone has what matters. And that's what matters to every human being. You just don't know it. Because you've been told that what matters is having lots of properties, or whatever it may be. Okay, what else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah. Of course, you want to hear that people like you. Uh, like as in validation? Yeah, and exactly. Is it good or not? Is it a negative impact? Everything can be good or bad depending on how you take it, right? Now, if I need it, and if I don't get it, I'm depressed. Then it's not so good. That's but really our ego, is that? That's right. So if I need it, and if I don't get it, I'm depressed, then it's a bad need. But if I get it and it feels good, that's good. So we have to come to the point where whether I get it or not, I don't need it because I know I did a good job. When I know I did a good job, I'm proud of myself, validation is very nice, but it's not necessary. Huh? I'm trying to make you more than a human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm trying to make you into more. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it, yeah, yeah, I understand. You're right. It's a normal human thing. I am trying to show you how to be more than just a normal human. All right? I'm trying to get to be a stage where we're free of the human needs and weaknesses and dependencies. In the Kabbalah, it says, in order to find God, you have to be wealthy. That's the Jewish mysticism. You have to be wealthy. Why? Because if I'm wealthy, I don't need anybody. I can take care of myself. So it's the same thing. Yes, you need it. It's normal. But I'm saying there's, it's better to not need it. To have it, if you can, it's good. But not to be like a drug addict, dependent. No, to need. I'm saying not to need and to, to be. If your happiness is dependent on feedback, there's a problem. Then your moods are, are subject to other people. I'm trying to get you to be free and independent so you choose your mood. 
Yeah, it's difficult, I know, but I'm just saying, it's better to not need it. And then when it's, you get it, it's great, but better to be independent. That's why I never drink, I never smoke, I never touch drugs, I never did anything. I have no dependencies. So then you're free. And it's the same thing on ego. Your ego is dependent, then you're not free. Then you'll be limited in your choices and your actions. It's okay, you don't have to agree with everything. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, you're right, but you're a human. Yeah. I'm an alien. I'm trying to make you all aliens, <laughs> where we're better than being just a human. We can fly around. <laughs> Sorry. And we can be alien. No, yes. Much nicer. The next world is much better. You're going to love it. So, yeah. All right? But that's what my work is about, trying to get you to be more than just a limited human with, with dependencies on others. So if I understand correctly what you said, we are creatures of habit, so we can create habits that bring us to be a cloud. Correct. Absolutely. Or is it, oh, it's not a permanent no. Once you've it. No, I have one friend we met about 30 years ago. The guy was the epitome of perfect human being. Humble, sweet, kind, caring, good listener, amazing man. And over the years, I noticed he's now he's getting older, but he's not so nice anymore. Now, when he was young, I asked him, how did you become so great? Because he's like 20 something years older than me. And he said, every night before I go to sleep, I review my day. And I think, what did I do well? What did I not do well? And that's how he became a great man. So now, you know, I said to him a couple of years ago, I said, you know, you're not so nice anymore. What happened? He said, do you still do this, this questioning yourself? He says, no, you know what? It came to a point where I couldn't find that I did anything wrong during the day, so I stopped reviewing my day. So he stopped the questions, and then he became a little different. So yeah, you, you have to always watch it as long as you're a human. Yeah. But it's not a big deal. The questions only take two, three minutes. It's a lot easier than doing other exercises. Yeah. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. What else? Okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, well, if it is really something negative and hurting you, you can either change your attitude towards it or get rid of it. Some things are better to just get rid of. Yeah. Yeah, and then move on to something new. If you're free, you can move to something new. If you're a prisoner, you hang on to something negative because you think you need it. But if you realize that I can adapt to anything, then you can let it go and move on. Okay? Did you, you had a question or not? Or just asking me to shut up? <laughs> 